All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Fabled Hunters. I'm Yanji. I'm Saint. And we're not opening any of this. No, we're not opening this stuff. <laughs> no, this we're, stuff we're not opening this stuff today. It's getting really close to the end of the year by the time this releases. Probably the last couple days of the year. So we wanted to do a final collection video and just a recap and a reminder to those of you who this is your first TCG or those of you that, which is probably most of you, haven't been in TCGs for 20 or 30 years. I, I think this would be helpful. I think this is uh, supposed to provide some perspective. I think we're gonna call the video A Link to the Past to see how everything links together. Yeah. Little play on Zelda as well. And it's also quite relevant because um, by the time this video releases, uh, the Alpha Charity Starter Break, MTG Starter Break, will have happened. Hopefully, there's not going to be too much feels bad. I've got, you know, I don't have Ryanji next to me opening the pack, so we might not hit a Black Lotus, but even if we hit a Power 9 or Dual Land, um, that would have been cool. So, that said, everything in TCG started in August of 1993 at Gen Con with... Magic the Gathering Alpha. This is an Alpha starter deck. 26,000 of these were made. Where there's only two rares in each of these starter decks. Kind of like two booster packs. Yes, yeah. kind of like basically two booster packs. So uh, these were basically double what a booster pack was, but they had extra uncommons, they had extra commons, they had more lands. There are only 70,000 booster packs in Alpha. So there are 26,000 of these, making 52,000 rares and 70,000 Alpha making um, 122,000 total rares. So you could view that as if Alpha Magic the Gathering only had 122,000 packs. And how this correlates to Flesh and Blood is that the namesake for Welcome to Wraith was, you know, that it was paying homage to Magic the Gathering Alpha. The mm. only set in Fab, Flesh and Blood, that has alpha print on it is Welcome to Wraith. And I believe that is James White showing respect to Magic the Gathering and the Roots, the granddaddy of all TCGs. So this is alpha, this is alpha. There's 24 packs in here. There's essentially two packs in here. 122,000 of uh, these packs were made or 122,000 packs worth of cards where this is 400,000 packs worth of cards. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, one would easily say, hey, well, there's probably four times more uh, WTR Alpha than there is regular Alpha. And I'd be like, uh, yeah, it was a different time in 1993. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and nobody knew nobody what TCGs had. were. This was, no this was foreign. No cell phones. Yeah, no cell phones, nothing. This is foreign to all the people at the time. They're like, I know what Dungeons & Dragons is. I know what comic books are, but trading yeah. card games? Who's going to play with silly little cards? We already have poker and, you know, bicycle playing cards. Why, why do we need a new card game? That's, that's literally how dismissive people were because it was new, it was disruptive. Yeah, that's why it's it just uh, important to recognize the roots, WTR and Alpha. Not only that, I do want to bring up that once you incorporate the second product, Beta, Magic the Gathering, Beta started two months later. Alpha was so successful that uh, Beta was immediately fired up and adopted. And Beta was literally three times the print run of Alpha. And the only way to tell is there's a serial number at the bottom of a Beta starter. There is no serial number on Alpha. And uh, otherwise, they are functionally identical. Beta was printed three times more. Yep, 795, 795. These were selling at one point in 1993 for seven dollars and 95 cents now a lot of people that play and collect flesh and blood they don't they don't really consider wtr to really stand alone they call it they say that maybe welcome to wraith is alpha but they consider arcane rising to be like alpha b-side the b-side of alpha mm -hmm. or if this is set one this is set one a because they complement each other and there are 400,000 uh, packs of Arcane Rising as well. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are three times 78,000 um, starters. So 78 plus 26 is 104? Yeah. 104,000 total starters. Now, if we multiplied that 122 number, right, by four, we'd get 488, 488. So combined, if you think about it, there are more 
alpha and beta products. There's more alpha and beta products than there are Welcome to Wraith or Arcane Rising. So if you think about it, like these cards are unique. These cards that were printed out were unique as well. Total cards is, I think, 10 million. So there's more Alpha and Beta Magic the Gathering out there than there are of Flesh and Blood, this product. So if you think about it, this is printed 26 years after, Yeah. right? So this is very scarce for how big the population has grown. And a lot of people that come in, they're like, oh, well, you know what? I bought these boxes for $80 a piece. Yeah. And now that they're up to a few thousand, you know, I, I should sell them. And I mean, I'm still buying this. I'm still buying this. Um, you know, I'm accumulating whenever I see the opportunity. I'm also opening. I'm accumulating to open, to enjoy, <laughs> because it still makes sense. Yeah. Like the beta deck is forty two to fifty thousand dollars right now. This deck is, I mean, it just sold for 108. It's probably gonna, you know, be worth, I don't know, a quarter million or higher within our lifetimes. So that's, for me at least, that's not viable. It's not a viable opening candidate, right? Not unless they get a lot of richer. <laughs> yeah, or, well, they're not printing anymore. So that supply is extremely, extremely limited. They're said to be maybe less than 250 alpha decks, less than 1% even sealed yeah. remaining. I mean, with attrition and how unpopular the game was and alpha being banned for the first 17 years of Magic the Gathering, uh, it, it makes sense, right? Yeah. Because even these alpha cards weren't even legal, so uh, a lot of them got destroyed. But going back to Flesh and Blood, this right now, you're, you're getting a piece of history. These two are only, there's only, what, 16,000 printed? And I would venture to guess that over 80%, some say up to 90% of WTR and of Arcane Rising have already been opened. That means there's probably between 1,500 to 3,000 of each of these product sealed remaining in the world. Mm -hmm. That is so little and, you know, the game's only been out for two years. Now, the people that are coming in now, they're like, oh, well, can I buy it for cheap? Can I... Find somebody to rip off who needs money really bad and buy it for $3,000? Um, probably. If you try hard enough, you probably could. But that's not really what it's about. It's about, you know, holding a piece of history. Because as long as Flesh and Blood even does even a percentage as good as Magic the Gathering, it's going to appreciate in value. Then it's going to get more and more players. And right now, I think anybody that's playing this game is saying this is a significantly better game than Magic ever was. I think also when you're talking about how a, an $8 starter pack turned into whatever tens of thousands of dollars. Yeah, yeah. It's also like a testament to like where a game can go. Yes, So absolutely. like now, even though you may not like the direction that Magic is headed, like can you imagine back when you started first started collecting mm -hmm. Magic the Gathering cards that they would be like Street Fighter characters or like whatever all these crossovers. No. That, that it reaches, well yeah. the fact that it reaches oh. a point in the in the popular consciousness that... The social it, zeitgeist, yeah, that well, it's just well, relevant enough, well, magic is yeah, relevant well, that, enough. Yeah, that even like it gets there, the fact that it can, that this game itself is like floating like a large, like multi-game corporation, like Hasbro, like magic is like floating there, mm -hmm. like their their profit their pnl statements when you see flesh and blood for like where it is right now it's like in it just began yeah people are starting to like play it competitively non-competitively whatever the case they're their first step they're they're getting like their first their fresh start right now yeah and yeah. so we don't really know like where the company lss the, we, have, we have no idea like, we we don't have any inside information because they have their own ip their intellectual property that they've built for many, many years. And I believe somewhere along the line, when uh, James White was working on the side of Magic, I believe he spent like 10 years in Hasbro or something like that. A yeah, handful of years, I, I, at I, least, I, in Hasbro. I think, I think he's worked, yeah, in various, uh, in the Yu-Gi-Oh! scene. Yu-Gi-Oh! Yu scene as well. Yep. Capacity. yep. And that's a point that I want to touch on a little bit later. But, but yeah, I, I just wanted to bring that up because... I think for everybody who's just kind of viewing these as like booster boxes and like the price of like a booster box and saying, yeah. like, oh, the cards in there aren't like worth like 
whatever or, or like how you evaluate it the same like you get you know how you guys are like oh like what's the ev of like opening the box i don't see like why i should like hold on to these of course etc I, I think you're missing the point which is that if flesh and blood is really uh a success and you mm -hmm. like really believe like in the ip you think that that the story that the, the setting is really good that the stories that you can tell through the card game are really good that you can like get a really strong community of players together that is greater than just like whatever fabled legendary of course the the value of the cards mm -hmm. correct as as long as it can keep growing in the eyes of the social consciousness and be more than just a fad that happened in you know early winter of 2021 then it's going to continue to expand um, that's why sometimes I have some angry videos, not not angry videos, but I mentioned like the flippers and the people that are coming here. They're just about the short term dollar. These are pieces of history. Welcome to Wraith. Arcane Rising are definitely pieces of history. They're very, very scarce. Like I said, there's only, you know, four figures, low four figures in existence in this sealed state because most of it has already been unsealed. At this time, um, Welcome to Wraith was the last unlimited printing to go out. Mm -hmm. And that's like Magic the Gathering un unlimited printing. These things going out. I don't have an unlimited starter deck, but like Alpha went out, Beta went out. Unlimited, I think, got printed in December and got sold out in December of 1993. And even the unlimited packs, uh, some of them in the high-end Magic groups, are for sale for 25000 So... Think about two packs of Welcome to Wraith being worth $25,000 in the future. And this is Alpha Welcome to Wraith. So Alpha packs right now are like $40,000 a piece. It's crazy. And as a matter of fact, I mean, uh, to just talk about how insane this is. As of the filming of this video, because the charity auction didn't happen yet, the only Magic the Gathering widely known to have been open in the world was at that Rudy event for Edwin's birthday. There was a 60-card starter deck that uh, Dan, Dan from Open Boosters opened, and Andy Schrock from uh, Power Nine Quest opened 15. So those 75 cards plus the presumably 120 cards are all the alpha that humanity has opened, at least publicly known mm -hmm. to have opened in 2021. And in 2020, fun fact, there are only 122 alpha cards. There was the 60 from the damaged uh, Kid Icarus alpha opening, and he had to reopen, he had to run it back, another 60. And the only other alpha to have been recorded to have been open was uh, because it was the holidays and I was celebrating the new year. I opened up a beta booster, but it turns out that it was a god pack. It had alpha rares in it. So that's 122 total alpha cards known in, in that whole year. And I mean, there's 8 billion people on the planet. And yeah. that, that, I mean, that that's it. So this is going to head towards that trajectory as long as people are loyal to the brand, as long as people believe in the brand. And now, forget about this being out of print, even the unlimited versions of, are out of print. And I personally believe that given enough time, the unlimited versions are gonna go up. So it's never really too late. Unlimited mm -hmm. is 80 to $100 a box right now. It's available for maybe even cheaper than that, right? Oh, you mean WTR? Unlimited? WTR, uh, or I, Arcane I think Unlimited. You can find, I think you can find deals around the $80 range. Yeah. High 70s. Okay. So great. And speaking of Unlimited, this is the most inferior of the early Magic the Gathering sets, but the most important cards. Here's the Moxen. Here are the five Moxen. And I mean, I just want to mention this. They're just quick mana, their resources, so to speak, that have, you know, provide different colors. These Moxen are five of the Power Nine cards that made Magic so popular. These are iconic as heck. These are just very, very insane, very, very in demand. All they do, they're like lands. They just pr produce mana. They produce blue, red, white, black, and green, the five color identities of Magic the Gathering. Now, the reason why I wanted to draw this parallel was because just like we've got the Power Nine, it feels like Flesh and Blood has the same elements. From WTR, we've got the four classes, the Scabskin Leathers for the Brute, Tech Plating for the Guardian, Mask of Momentum for the Ninja, and Brave Forge Bracers for the Warrior. From Arcane Rising, you've got Techlo Foundry Heart, 
for the mechanologists, Scobum Crossrap. For Ranger, Azalea, RIP Azalea, hashtag free Azalea. <laughs> um, we've got Grasp of the Arc Knight yeah. for Runeblade, right? Enough Runeblades out there. There's not enough Grasp of the Arc Knight Cold Falls to go around. And we've got Storm Striders for Womp Womp Kano. Kano, don't, don't hit on Kano. <laughs> Kano just won a national. Oh, he did? Yeah. Which one? Wait, Italy. Italy? And he got second at Hong Kong. Okay. Go Kano. <laughs> Still won't play him. I'm waiting for a new wizard. Okay. One with full health points. <laughs> so these, see, these are like the color identities, uh, similar to like classes, right? Are similar to like jobs, similar to these uh, hero profiles. So yeah, these are the color identities, the five color identities of Magic the Gathering, making up five of the original Power Nine, one for each color, just like their legendaries, one for each hero. Mm -hmm. Now on top of that, moving on, we have... You know, the colors are blue in the Power Nine, but I mean, they didn't they didn't really, I don't think they really thought it out that much back then, um, oh. making blue super, super strong, yeah, yeah. making them the rune blade of, um, of Magic the Gathering. We've got three pieces of Power Nine that happen to be blue, but they're universally recognized as extremely powerful, Yeah. right? So they're the blue Power Nine. Ancestral Recall let you draw three cards, like at any instant, like, imagine there was a card that let you draw three cards. Oh, wait, Azalea has one, right? <laughs> yeah, but it was, like, way worse. Yeah. Uh, also, yep. uh, I think I think it's pretty funny that when they were designing the set, they thought that Ancestral Recall was, like, on the yeah. same scale as, like, Lightning Bolt. A Lightning Bolt. Three damage, right? Yeah. Versus three cards. They didn't really think it out because they're like, you've got 60 cards. What type of advantage would it be uh, to get three cards in one moment? I mean, that's, like, three turns of information and play. Yeah. Right? And then there's Time Walk that lets you take an additional this turn. One, one turn? One turn. Two, two <laughs> mana, one turn. And then a Time Twister that lets you recycle, restart the whole game with seven cards. Same life total, but restart the game basically. Yeah. Putting your graveyard, shuffling in your library, and having a fresh hand to go pound somebody's face in. So speaking of that, I would correlate the blue Power 9 yeah. to the generics. Because the generics are recognized as being all powerful, right? Mm -hmm, sure. So, kind of like the Find All Spring Tunic and the Arcanite Skullcap. Because I mean, almost every vintage deck can be made better. Well, every vintage deck should play blue, and every vintage deck that has blue can be made better by these three cards. I mean, that's pretty much universally accepted. Big shout out to Time Twister. They've made a lot of videos on this. Time Twister has currently, within just these two recent years, become the second most valuable piece of Power 9. Five years ago, ten years ago, it used to be 9 out of 9. And the reason being, this is accepted in um, multiplayer play, or commander play. Mm -hmm. So, uh, people are even saying this is going to be the most valuable Power 9 one day. We'll see. That's crazy. Yes, it's, in so it's to insane to think about that, yeah. Time Twister was almost unplayable, it was like the worst out of the Power 9. Like you put in the moxins, you, you wouldn't even play the color and you put in the moxins just for turbo mana for extra fast resources. But I mean, find all spring tunic. I don't think there's anything that just produces resources right now, right? Not, not with the flexibility. Yeah, yeah. It's just there and it will bring you three re one resource every three turns, yep. which is surprisingly strong. And this can make any, you know, regular deck conceivably better any mm -hmm. hero better by just adding it and same thing with this uh the arcane barry is not used that often the main thing is that it's a helmet that blocks for three yeah right that's that's the main thing with the arcanite skull cap and it can be used on everybody so these are the generics these two uh are fixtures for every deck they make almost any deck better right just like I, what i said I, that's probably, it's kind of funny that you said that about the time twister because yeah. I honestly like if if you're thinking about like the future of the game, uh -huh. everybody who plays competitively will think that skull cap like fits in more decks. Oh yeah, but I could actually see like tunic for example. Like right now, you're only limited by like the number of cards that they printed that you can play. Yeah, but yeah. if you think about it, like things like this like scale. Like the more cards that they that they print over the course of time. Mm -hmm. Just like the more play patterns. So more combos, more. more viability yeah. for Spring Tunic. It unlocks more. Yeah, I mean, even when oh. Vestige of Soul, even when that came out, I started literally going prism player to prism player, asking them, hey, Vestige of Soul, does that make Find All Spring Tunic, like, redundant? Does it, like, 
make it antiquated and that's the end of life or find all spring tunic for illusionists the prism player is like no if anything the vestige of soul is a situational one i start my loadouts with find all spring tunic more often than not and i'm just like i, I get it they explained it to me i was like i get it but but why but it's just so so versatile yeah. right it's just so versatile so these are the generics and that's how i relate to uh them in the, in the magic scale of the power nine and the last one would obviously be, in Magic, the Black Lotus. This is like, you know, the Rolls Royce of trading cards. And that correlates to the Fables, the Heart of Findall and the Eye of Ophidia. Sure. Now this, um, unlike currently either of these, uh, the Black Lotus just gave an overpowered, sick and versatile amount of mana. At any point, coming in and just dropping resources in the form of any colored mana, made you a lot stronger immediately. I think there's something within the design space of Flesh and Blood that makes these gems, mm -hmm. currently these two gems, um, like they're, they're dormant. There's still some latent power or some potential additional power uh, coming. There has to be because all these gems have their characteristics. So far it's gain life, so far it's opt, and you had mentioned something about the design space. Yeah, right? well, hold on. The one thing you gotta see, like, they made a word in the game, mm -hmm. gem, yep. for these cards. They made a card type for it so that they're, like, thinking about something. But I wanted to, I, I mentioned earlier that I know that James, and I think some of the other people on, on their team have some experience in Yu-Gi-Oh!, and so I think that the comparisons that you made to the Magic cards all do make a lot of sense. But mm -hmm. I, I think for the viewers, maybe some people also who came watching this video, like uh, who are Magic players, mm -hmm. uh, if you don't play a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh, then you might not understand. Like Flesh and Blood, I think as a uh, as a game is more similar to Yu-Gi-Oh than it is to Magic, just in terms of. Mm -hmm. Uh, how you build the decks. The developers kind of have made archetypes. Okay. Uh, ahead of time, Magic is a little bit more like free-flowing, more creative uh, in that respect. One thing in particular, uh, if you are a collector of Yu-Gi-Oh! Yeah. Is that the probably like the two most expensive cards from the original Yu-Gi-Oh! set is mm -hmm. the Dark Magician and the Blue-Eyes White Dragon. Yep, yep. So those, I've heard about those cards. Yeah, so those are like the two most iconic monsters in all of Yu-Gi-Oh! It just like goes to show that those two creatures like aren't on the same power level of Black Lotus and Magic. Like Black Lotus, everyone will recognize that this card is just like busted. Stu stupid strong. <laughs> yeah. Stupid strong. I mean, they, they didn't have that much time to really design it. Like, they're just like, oh, it's three mana. Okay, what, what's three mana going to do? Like, cast me a whole bunch of cards and let me go infinite in many, many situations, yeah. right? But, but um, the reason why I wanted to bring those two up is, like, the, those two cards are pretty expensive for their, like, significance uh, to the game mm -hmm. and the history of the game. But then also, Konami, very interestingly, has, like, over the course of the years, like, these are just two, like, vanilla monsters that, like, in many ways get, like, outclassed mm -hmm. later on when you creep up uh, the power of your of your game. But throughout the course of the years, they recognized, they said, okay, look, like, these are the most important characters in our game. Yep. And... So in order to kind of support them, we're going to make cards around them. We're going to make cards that if you have a Blue-Eyes White Dragon in your deck, you can like do something like cool. If yeah. you have a Dark Magician in your deck, like, like they interact with them in different ways. And I think that Flesh and Blood is kind of set up in a similar way. Mm -hmm. I think when you think about when Magic first actually, like very late in the game, like introduced like real characters like Planeswalkers. Yeah. They think about like what Jace means for for the community of Magic the Gathering. What, like the what, ultimate sorcerer, Jace. Yeah, like what yeah. Jace means. Pure Tom, blue mage. Yeah, right? Tondra, Teferi, whatever. Yep. These are like iconic characters. Liliana. Yeah, Liliana within within the game. And Welcome to Wraith, Arcane Rising. A lot I, I hear a lot of people say like, oh, when they come out with like these like talented heroes, all the old heroes are gonna be obsolete mm -hmm. or like whatever. But you have to also like think about it from this perspective, like the game studio has spent like years of development time and yep. like, character building and like thinking about like, and then they chose these like eight heroes. Mm -hmm. And they're like, these are the eight characters that we want at the very beginning of the game. And they can ones. grow, yes, yes. And they they carry the story along. Right? Yeah, like, like these are the ones that we've decided are gonna be like the first heroes and they're gonna be like forever associated. So 
when like five six years down the line when they come out with a new set and then there's like hero whatever like nameless like ninja yeah whatever. ninja number eight yeah yeah you're still like katsu is still going to be like the ninja how do they yeah how does ninja number eight compare to katsu yeah right and then so i think when you think about that when you think about like gems like that they've, the fact that they've like taken the time to like make a a, a card a card type for it yep when you think about these legendaries and let's just like be honest they're for sure going to reprint these legendaries not like the cold foils but they're going to reprint these like, like the cards oh in, in some in some capacity at, at some point yeah, yeah like in so. order in order for the players like if if the game grows larger and and you can't get your hands on like like they're gonna they, they left that window open and it's fair it's fair game yeah they right print, like non foil they, they can print any of these Rain, rainbow foil just foil. not in cold foil format yeah. but but i the reason why i wanted to highlight that is because when you think about what which cards in, in the various games that exist are are the ones that become like really collectible mm -hmm. the ones that become iconic yeah. and, and how do they get to that how did they get to that place mm. So you think about, like, in Magic, you have, like, obviously Power 9, but then you have cards like Lightning Bolt is very, like, sought after, like, Brainstorm. Of course. Uh, all of these cards, they represent more than just, like, what they do. They, they represent... They're like, iconic. Yeah, like, people look yeah. at those cards like, oh... Like, They're icons of the I game. I know, I know that... So so I think that these these cards that you've taken out, the Power 12 or whatever you're calling it, mm -hmm. these are, like, our... The gems and legendaries, yeah. Yeah, our icons. These are, yes, these are the icons of flesh and blood. They're imprinted into us for the future, just like for the Magic players. These nine cards represent, like, the absolute pinnacle of Magic the Gathering. And to provide a little bit of perspective, there are about 400 of these and 400 of these. And these are the original printings. This is not even the original printing. This is an unlimited Black Lotus. There was 1,000 of the Alpha Black Lotus. There were 3,000 of the Beta Black Lotus. This is the unlimited. So this is kind of like an unlimited Heart of Fine Doll. And this was made at the end of 1993. The unlimited Heart of Fine Doll, what, ended print just last month, November of 2021. This card right now in its current form is about $50,000. This is the white bordered garbage knockoff version of the black lotus yeah just like one day uh the unlimited printing of heart of fine doll is probably going to be worth significantly more than it is now like even even the heart of fine doll right now is what 300 dollars, 270 280 yeah something like something that. like that something like a single digit amount of hundreds of dollars and the unlimited version the rainbow foil is out of print it's it's not available anymore. It doesn't matter. You don't have to get one of the 400, although it's it's definitely nice. You definitely, if you get one, you don't want to sell it, right? You want to hold on to it. There's never too late of a time to get in. In the whole spectrum of things, in the whole like timeline of things, this happened like at the very, very beginning. If, if there's like a minute, this happened at like second two of Magic the Gathering, even an asset from second two of Magic the Gathering, if the timeline were a whole minute, is has gone up a thousand times, probably. These were available for 50 bucks in 1994, yep. right? A thousand times. And here we are on second two of Flesh and Blood. Mm -hmm. And it's not just only about the cold foils, it's about the sealed product and how limited it is and how beautiful they look in these holders. This one's actually not that beautiful. This is Dominic's, because I can tell it's got that rip. That said, just think about it, everybody. We're on second two. It's super early. Everything's just begun. You still have access to Unlimited. If you can afford it, you still have access to Alpha. You still have access to, we'll call it Beta or Alpha 2 for those that uh, want to say that Arcane Rising is like the B side of the original printing. So, I should kind of view them as both as like Alphas. You do? Yeah, because I, I think I think that I could see a world where they do like a combined like WTR. There, there's only one with the the print printed label, <laughs> this first edition. And yeah. I mean, hey, hey, I, I'm just following James on this, you know. No, no, no I hear you. <laughs> I actually thought that they were gonna keep um, WTR and Arcane Rising Unlimited in print for like a, a little bit longer. Uh, I did too. Look, like they're probably going to make like a reprint product or or whatever, and then that for me would be like beta. It's like after the initial wave. Like we're we're still in like the. Initial wave of adopters, I think. Yeah, we definitely are. For worldwide uh, recognition, I think it was end of 2020. It's This game's been around essentially for a year. It's been known to the public, the general public, 
for essentially a year yeah. and it's still super, super early. Those people that are whining left and right and getting out, they don't get it. There were so many times that Magic the Gathering was almost dead. Like in 1994, um, right after the summer, fall of 1994, teachers, principals, PTA members, the Karen moms, they were out there saying that there's demonic pictures, there's naked women, Magic the Gathering is making people evil, it's making them worship the devil. Wizards of the Coast needs to be stopped. This is, you know, this is not, not good and rotting our children's brains and, you know, corrupting their sentiments. Blah, 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 blah. Nowadays, you know, the community themselves are doing more than their fair share of that. And I mean, guys, just, just appreciate it for what it is. This is the second coming of the greatest TCG game ever. Like, there was no other TCG game. This was the, the first. This time, this iteration of trading card games, this is the best game that's come out since. And I mean, I played The Eternal Struggle, a game about vampires. It's like J-Y. Yeah, Jihad, yeah, Jihad. And then I played Star Trek. I didn't know what I was doing, but I played Star Trek, the next generation game. I've got friends that collect Star Trek and I'm ashamed on their behalf, <laughs> D-Rod. And um, I even played and collected Star Wars for a little bit. None of those games have the appeal of flesh and blood. I think people just, need to hang in there and stick to their guns. If they really believe in the game, hold on to your cold foils. Like you're trying to exit, you know, second two within the, the timeline. Like wait, wait for a good time to exit, wait for the game to mature, see what happens, give the publisher a chance, give them time to develop and release their intellectual property, their story, and all of the other products that are coming along with it. It's gonna be a really fun ride, so. Yeah, that's just my two cents. Well, hope you guys like what you see. Hope you guys learned a thing or two today and we'll see you next time. Bye.